Okay. Uh, so we're up and running, and uh, I just wanted to welcome you all uh, to our conversation with Ellen Soderbergh, uh, editor of the St. Louis Post-Dispatch, and uh, she and I have crossed paths professionally at least three times in my career. Uh, I've, only worked at three, I've only worked at three newspapers, Kurt. We worked together at all three. Oh, yeah, that's right. So I, I didn't work at four. You were born when I worked at Chicago today. That's right. That's right. Um, so what, I'll, what I want to do is two quick pieces of housekeeping. Um, what you'll notice, um, the first thing I'll say is that we're going to keep this to uh, a, an hour or less, uh, which is what I promised in the, in the first place. Uh, the second thing I'll say is um, what you probably will notice as, you, as we go on is that whoever is talking becomes the featured picture on your screen. And uh, that's fine if that works for you, but what I find is that it's, uh, it's easier for me to click on somebody's face and make them the, the, the featured speaker and just leave them up on the screen the whole time because I find it disquieting for it to bounce back and forth. That's your, your preference, however. So uh, the first thing I wanted to just do is uh, introduce Ellen, um, who um, uh, started as a copy boy, and yes, that's the word she would use. That was, uh, that was at, the uh, official payroll job title, set of exactly. paychecks. Uh, so she was a copy boy at the Chicago Daily News, which doesn't exist anymore. But um, And then I knew her when she was political editor for the Chicago Tribune. She um, left that paper when she, you were, you were deputy editorial page editor. Yes. Uh, up there, right? The Chicago Tribune, yeah. And then uh, became the managing editor at the Sun Sentinel in Fort Lauderdale, which is where uh, Ellen is in Fort Lauderdale right now. Uh, and then she moved to become the editor of the St. Louis Post-Dispatch and was the editor there for four years. Um, anything uh, else you want to tell us about just sort of in, the, in by way of introduction, Ellen? Well, um, I grew up in the St. Louis area, and um, most of my family lived there. Um, actually, I won't be going quite as often because, as Kurt knows, my mother just passed away a month ago, but I used to come up well, over the past several years, six to eight times a year. So I'm still pretty familiar with St. Louis, and I grew up in East St. Louis, that garden paradise across the river from you. <laughs> So even though I was editor of Post for just five years, I'm very familiar with um, with St. Louis in, in general and uh, with Wash U, which is a great school. And the only reason I didn't go there was it was too close to my mom and dad. So I went to Northwestern because to get 300 miles between us at least. <laughs> but, uh, so that's just a little bit that I, that I do. I've spent all my career in uh, newspapers and with some digital work too. I mean, Kurt was running the digital operation, the news. But those were part; those were parts of our news operations. It wasn't a separate then. So, in news, in print, print and digital news. Sure. Um, so, uh, why don't you, you guys, uh, tell Ellen a little bit about yourself? Um, how about um, Alyssa? You go, go first. Sure. Um, I'm Alyssa Banford. I am a U College student uh, for public affairs. I graduate in May of this year, um, and I've, I've worked full-time uh, in addition to doing school part-time for seven years. Um, I've done marketing with Google and Mercedes-Benz and Edward Jones. Um, and now I'm working for a startup company called Cinec um, and doing public careers for them. Sure. Um, okay. um, welcome, Jillian. Hello. Sorry, I wasn't sure how to use this. Well, you're, you've made it. So um, I'll just recap real quickly. If if you find it disquieting for the picture to jump back and forth, just click on somebody's face and they will stay up on the screen. Um, uh, why don't you go ahead and give us a brief introduction of yourself? Okay. You've already my, met. Sorry. My name is Jillian. Uh, I work in Clayton for a private equity firm. And I'm a junior at Wash U. Um, I think I've had a few of you in class now that I'm seeing your faces. <laughs> um, and that's about it. Okay. Uh, how about, are you still there, uh, Vanessa? Yes, I'm here. Okay, and you're on deck. Um, and you're on deck, Tara. 
All right, so uh, I'm a marketing major. I will be graduating in May. Um, sorry, can you hear that? <laughs> yes. <laughs> There's like a plane going over my house. Um, so by day, I actually work with the St. Louis Ballet. Uh, so I'm a dancer by day, and I'm a marketing student by night. Okay, thanks. Go ahead, Tara. All right, my name is Tara Sandretto. I actually work at WashU in the registrar's office. I'm a student, not candidate for a degree, so I'm just kind of taking classes right now. And that's all. Okay, thank you. Um, so it is a good idea to mute your uh, line while you are not talking, but uh, we'll just go ahead and dive in with some questions, and then we'll definitely have some time for, for you guys to ask questions as well. Um, so let's just start with this, Ellen. I mean, tell me what it meant to be a copy boy when you first started out. Um, well, newspapers were published, um, physically published very differently than they are now. So this is going to make me feel really old. Um, we had no computers in the newsroom. We had uh, typewriters and pencil and papers, and we had... Um, uh, a big, big old, these huge, big old printing presses that were not, did nothing to protect the employees from inhaling ink all day long, which was not a good thing. And um, at the Daily News, we had these conveyor belts that conveyed the copy once it came off the copy desk and took them downstairs to the floor, floor below us to the people who manually sat at these giant machines and typed like on a typewriter, but they were setting type. And um, so it was a very different operation. And uh, that was only the second woman outside of World War II to uh, be a copy boy at the Daily News, which was a, a major and very highly respected newspaper at the time. I really wanted to work at it. Um, but um, it was my senior year at Northwestern. And basically, you, you sharpened pencils for people. Um, I still love the man who uh, let me use his pencil sharpener. He had an electric one. He was a columnist, but his wife who was a columnist with him. Didn't was always pissed off, so I could only use it when she was out. And I'd bring beer and cigarettes for Mike Royko, the columnist, every night at 10 o'clock sharp from the Billy Goats Tavern. And um, uh, running copy around, literally, you'd pick the copy around by paper. Now, of course, everything was computer, but it was so it was. It was, uh, that's how the that copy boy, you were moving copy all the time. And I worked night, so I also answered the phones. And that was a great education, sitting next to the Night City editor, who was an interesting man. In fact, he just retired from running um, the, um, the big project in Chicago that has freed so many um, people who, of murder and others. Oh, I, th I think uh, we're we're gonna. Is everybody else still there? Yes. Yeah. Okay. I'm sure Ellen will be back shortly. Um, I mean, so just to while while we're waiting for her to get back in. Hello. Oh, there you are. Okay. Yeah. I know. All of a sudden, I got this message that I've been. Uh, they lost lost the signal. I don't know. Okay. Well, you're back. So, okay. so, so, anyway, so it was a very, very different than today. Very manual, very old-fashioned, very sexist. Um, <laughs> they had the uh, the three of the four daily newspapers in Chicago then had quotas on how many women could work as reporters in the newsroom as opposed to being in features or the society page. And at that time, the quota was um, was four. It had moved up to two in, in recent years. So they were at quota. So the jobs that they offered me were assistant to the society editor, secretary to the business editor. Now I'm coming on Northwestern with a degree in journalism, you know. And I was uh, first, second in my class. And uh, the third job he offered me was assistant to the food editor. And I told the managing editor, I said, but I don't know how to cook. And he said, oh, that's all right. It'll come naturally to you. <laughs> I felt like a young black person to whom had just been offered the tap dancing beat. God, wow. Yeah. So that was, that was kind of how things were then. <laughs> very different from now, very different. So what, 
what is something, seen uh, progression over the years, you know, of all the changes, for many for good and some now for, you know, just very disruptive in the business. What What would you say is something that you're in, in, when, over the course of your career that you're that you've been involved in that is that that you're really proud of that you're really um, um, fond of having been associated with. Yeah, well, outside of, of getting Mayor Jane Byrne in Chicago to evict the Tribune from City Hall, which was kind of fun, and that was due to a story that I had gotten exclusively and pissed her off mightily. Um, the the two, the, involved, the one I'm some of the work I'm most proud of, you know, we have you know some that won a lot of prizes and things, but I thought our work that we did my last year at the Sun Sentinel on Elian Gonzalez, whom um, you there in. St. Louis at your age and distance may not remember, but it was a huge story both nationally and particularly down here about a little Cuban boy whose mother tried to bring him over with other people on a raft from Cuba and his mother drowned and then there was this big fight as to whether he would stay here with fam her family or, or go back to Cuba and it was a huge story and very complicated one much more complicated than the um, national media tend to treat it and I thought we did really good work on that story in terms of trying to help people understand the dynamics of the Cuban community and get beyond the cliches and the simplistic images and also then that same year was the 2000 election where Al Gore won the popular vote and but was declared the loser in Florida but he wasn't declared the loser for 30 days so we had 30 days going on and we were the only the Sun Sentinel was the only newspaper major newspaper at least in Florida that did not call the election for for Bush that night we had it as too close to call and everybody the next morning or sometime in the middle some of them in the middle of the night retracted their call for him the vote difference wound up being about 500 votes but that was a month later. A lot of people still think that he, that Al Gore actually won that election. And just for some perspective for, for the rest of you, the, 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 the Sun Sentinel, of course, is based in Fort Lauderdale. Immediately to the south in Miami is the Miami Herald, which was sort of the granddaddy newspaper. Um, at the time, it had the biggest circulation in the state. Uh, and then immediately to the north of uh, the Sun Sentinel was the Palm Beach Post which was also a formidable um, competitor. Yeah. Um, one, I want to sort of turn it the other way now and ask, is there something in the course of your career that is among your biggest frustrations, something that you've dealt with as a journalist? Um, you know, not an individual story or an incident, but is there something in particular that as a theme was a frustration for you? Um, there's so many. <laughs> Even in those days when we had a lot more, newspapers had a lot more in common than we had now, the, the boss, the, the companies always wanted more. And you'd be trying just to get a couple more reporters or a couple more editors to make the thing better to, or to do something specific or to launch a new section that you knew would be successful. And instead they insisted that you had to send more money to the home, to the corporation every year. And they had profit margins in the 20 and 30 percentiles, which is huge. Uh, most businesses would wouldn't ever be able to dream of having those percentiles, but they wanted us to be up in the 40s percents, like TV stations were at the time. So they were kind of, even though we were making money in the case of the Sun Sentinel faster than Chicago could count it, and we had the highest profit margin in the company. I never got one extra nickel out of them. Every year was a fight to minimize cuts, not um, not let the company you know invest and grow. Papers did not invest in their futures. They just sucked, kept sucking profits out so that when things started to collapse financially with the advertising market collapsing and all the competition from the digital media, what was called new media at the time, um, they, they, they had never invested in the future. Most newspapers didn't. And so they, they didn't have a, um, a plan for, for long-term operating and they all just did. So they're still to this day trying to cut themselves into higher profit margins, and it's it works worse every year. That's in, I'm glad you brought that up because it actually dovetails nicely with um, what we've we've been uh, working on in this unit in our class, 
and what chapter 10 in Herrick's book was talking about um, among the many forces that have been at work here um, you know consolidation of in, in, the, in the news media and in the communications industry consolidation in retail um, and part of that consolidation has created these mammoth public companies that demand growth every quarter and need to and their shareholders need to see uh, growth in, in revenue every quarter and that goes to kind of what you're talking about here Ellen yeah there's hardly a newsroom in America other than the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal and they have suffered some cuts um, Kurt are you there yes I am because I get this kind of message says it's taking too long to connect you to this video call try again but I'm on it so I just you're still there keep going uh, yeah I just can't see anybody but um, uh, now you're starting to freeze up uh, that's okay uh, I'm, again I'm sure she's gonna come back so uh, does anybody ra raise your hand if you have a question that you think would dovetail into what we've been just been talking about one's coming back on the call right now is that okay hang on a second welcome and, um, by the way I didn't say hello that you joined us is your uh, name pronounced Kurth uh, it is yes Kurth okay good yeah I was just welcoming Jacob Kurth into to the call, uh, who joined us while you were speaking earlier, Ellen. Okay, uh, can you tell I mean, us a little bit about yourself? Look, look at the postage patch, Kurt, and you know it, they charge a dollar fifty now for the daily paper. Yeah, and the size of it is about a third of what it used to be. So they're asking you to pay three times as much for a third of a paper. Yep, um, and and that's not a recipe for long-term success. I mean, that's just that's a recipe for death. Well, I'm, I'm really glad you talked about the idea that newspapers haven't invested in their future because that's long been my belief too, my strongly held belief that, you know, other, other news media, other emerging news media and other communications media have the advantage of not having that legacy background. Right. And, and so they've really poured a lot of money and resources into, um, uh, paying for and hiring uh, programmers who can really do some cool stuff, uh, yeah. and, and with the data that we get about readership and and that sort of thing, um, or provide tools to readers that newspapers haven't been able to provide. Yeah, and most of the, it, it, even most of the newspaper websites are still pretty clunky. They don't look that much different than they did. Ten years ago, the only one that I, I'm sure there's more than this that they're doing it well, but I, I'm a New York Times subscriber, so I get I can get them in any format I want for free, other than Kindle. They'll sell me the Sunday New York Times, which I pay seven fifty or something to get here at home delivery. They sell it to me for ninety nine cents on Kindle. <laughs> yep, yep. So I get everything except the crossword puzzle for ninety nine cents. But their sites are really easy to use, and they stay up to date. And I can read the newspaper. I often read it because I travel a lot. I often read it on my phone, and it's really easy to do. But a lot of the sites for in, it are just still look cluttered, and they're hard to find stuff, and they're slow to load. And so they're not even doing a good job now. After all these years, I'm keep, I'm even keeping up with the basics. What have become the basics um, to be able to actually use it ha happily online? I have a question from a student who can't who wasn't. Uh, able to be here, but he submitted it in advance, and I feel like this is a good time to ask. Christopher Score asked, um, I'm going to paraphrase a little bit. Is it S K O R? Correct. I wonder if he's my doctor's son. My doctor, <laughs> my doctor in St. Louis is Donald Score. You can ask him if that's his dad. I'll do that. <laughs> uh, but his question is um, Was there ever sort of a moment during your career where you thought, boom? Uh, the business is never going to be the same. You know, it's changed and it's like completely different. Or, or going forward, it's never going to be like it was. Well, the whole time I was in the business, it was changing, and it was ex and, and mostly that was exciting. 
because I mean, you know, when I joined the Tribune, they were still operating like it was the 50s or the early 60s, and you know, and they were so backward. And you know, during the years I was there, they, they were changing all the time. But it was exciting because they were changes of aimed toward quality of public service. They were growing staff. We were trying different things. Um, some of which worked, some of which didn't. But I, I, I love change. I love change. But it's the strangling change that's going on now that doesn't enable you to change that allows you to do things that are interesting, challenging, creative. That's great change. That's wonderful. So I'm not anti-change, but I'm, I, I'm against stupid myopic change. Sure, sure. And that's what we've seen for the past 10 years or so. Um, so that moment came, um, oh, I'd say about, uh, for me, it came about two weeks after Lee Enterprises bought the post dispatch. <laughs> <laughs> when I realized what they were really like. Yeah, yeah, okay, I understand. So, just the background there is some of you may know that the post dispatch used to be owned for generations by the Pulitzer Company. Um, um, uh, you know, founded by or bought by Joseph Pulitzer the first, uh, 130, 135 years ago, um, and it was owned by the Pulitzers until I don't remember what year it was. About um, 2005. Yeah, yeah. So, um, what? So that's the same Pulitzers as the Pulitzer Prizes, which your class has probably heard of, and. And Mrs. Pulitzer, who is the widow of the third Joseph Pulitzer, she still lives in St. Louis. And Ledoux, she has she has her summer home in Ledoux and her winter home in the city. Ah, right. And is she, she stayed with the Pulitzer Museum? She she built that. Yeah, yeah. Her foundation. Don't call it a museum. She'll throw something at you. It's her foundation. <laughs> um. So. We were, I guess, we were talking about this, and maybe you've already answered this, but I, I guess I'm going to ask anyway. What, what do you think the biggest contributors to the state of the newspaper industry right now would be? I mean, how, how did we get where we are? And are well, certainly, all the, all the, um, the digital media we have, and there's going to be much more to come. I mean, there'll be things we're all using a year or two from now that we aren't even dreaming of right now. I mean, it, it changes so fast, and, and that's fine. Um, but that was the biggest change, and two, because of newspapers' lack of investing in themselves for the long term, and just seeing only the the corporate picture of 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 just sucking as much money as they could out of the papers, that fed right into the other what they, what should have been a an exciting, if scary, proposition. Um, turned into be a killer um, much um, sooner than it should have. All right, I'm going to ask one more question, and then I'm going to start putting you guys on the spot. Um, so be thinking of what you'd like to ask uh, Ellen as well. Um, here's an easy one for you, Ellen. Are newspapers going to die? Well, I've said for 20 or 30 years, people have been predicting newspapers' death as long as I've worked in them, which is 19... Uh, 72 when I graduated from college. Actually, I hasn't worked there before I graduated, but um, I always said that newspapers, if they if they die, it wouldn't be because somebody else killed them off. Because actually, you know, everybody thought radio would kill them off. Well, newspaper companies invested in radio and found a great source of uh, new cash cows, um, and and uh, they and they both thrived and the same with television everybody thought television was going to kill off newspapers and and it didn't in fact uh, local tv news operations a lot of them are, are suffering now too with bad cuts trying to sustain outrageous pop profit margins so yeah i think they are going to in a sense we've already seen partial deaths i mean a lot of major newspapers now are only available three days a week new orleans and and particularly, that's the um, Newhouse newspapers. It's called Advanced Publications, but it's owned by the Newhouse family. And they've been doing that with their papers in Ann Arbor and uh, um, Cleveland and New Orleans. Um, 
And then the, the, one of the Detroit papers only publishes, I think, like once or twice a week, and the rest of the time it's only online. So they're killing themselves. I mean, they will have killed themselves off. And right. I mean, I think, and what I'm referring to is specifically that printed thing that gets thrown on your driveway every morning. Oh, well, but the problem is, Kurt, is the printed thing still, even with all its troubles, makes more money in advertising revenue than the online sites do. And the model for journalism in the United States has been that advertising played the bulk, paid for the bulk of it. And um, so it wasn't just the digital media. It was also that the, the, the main um, sources of revenue that have always um, been the biggest cash cows for um, newspapers also has been running away at, or dying off at the same time. If, and this was even before the recession, although the re recession hastened some of this. If you look at it, department stores. There used to be competing department stores in every market and there still are in St. Louis, so you're lucky. You still get at least a little bit of departments for advertising. But newspapers used to have page after page after page, particularly in the front section of ads from in what, what's now Macy's, uh, was famous bar in St. Louis and Dillard's and whoever else was there. And you know Macy's did not buy up every department chain in the country and, and change a famous brand such as Marshall Fields in Chicago to Macy's just so it could continue to advertise bras in every newspaper in the country. They did it so they could concentrate on TV ads, mailers, and a national strategy. So they're not advertised in newspapers. So that was a huge, huge source of revenue for newspapers, and that ain't coming back. In a sense, the daily newspapers in the U.S. are much like a department store. If you realize there's kind of something there for everybody, you know, if you, you know, if you wanted jewelry, stockings, clothes, you wanted toys, you wanted cookware, you wanted sheets. Department stores carried all this stuff and they used to carry more. I mean some do still carry furniture and they used to carry even more than they do now. And that's kind of where the newspaper was. You know, they have everything from the bridge column and the horoscope to serious analysis and editorials. And so they're kind of like department stores and they kind of people lose interest in them for some of the same reason they've lost department stores. They want more specialty things and bypass, you know, not to be, not to even have to walk down the aisles of things they don't want. And that's kind of true for newspapers too. So that's gone. Um, real estate's gone. Even now the market's picked up. High, high value properties are, there's still some in newspapers, but they're a natural for online where people can go online, do it by zip code, see the insides of the houses. Uh, that's not going to come back in any kind of big way. Um, autos, auto dealers actually still like newspapers and they're doing well enough now that the newspaper advertising appears to be up from what I can see. But um, I don't know how long that will last and that market is cyclical. So when auto sales were down terribly a few years ago, newspapers were getting killed on that. Um, so there's few cash cows left except like obituaries which they charge an arm and a leg for. And um, yep. uh, so most of their a advertising, and there's nothing. That, so, so the biggest sources of revenue for newspapers, oh, and classified ads, and of course that went first because people wanted the searchable ads, so that went first. Um, and that's not going to come back because they can't compete with the format. Um, so, um, so that that's going away. And but there's not been Kurt. You you tell me what's replaced it that brings in those kinds of bucks online. Nothing. nothing. Yeah. And 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 I mean the the fact is I think I think print newspapers are going to be going away, and it's going to have to require an entire rebalancing of the business model. You're just not going to be able to support a news operation anywhere near the size of the one that used to exist at the Post Dispatch or the Sun Sentinel. That's right. And then. And, then people people are going to get away with more crap in terms of corruption, government corruption, and business corruption and bad practices and everything else than they than they already do now. I'll give you a really simple example of that. You know, I mean, I, I my students know that um, among the things in my background was working for Patch.com, which right. covered hyperlocal news in 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 small communities all over the St. Louis area. And one of the first things that our team did 
was go to the police departments and say, we want to look at your police blotter on a regular basis. Yeah. Um, and most of the time, they looked at us like we were from Mars because it had been so long since anybody asked them that question. Right, right. And they, they forgot that they were required to show that stuff. Much less investigating where any of, whether any of these majority black communities now had black cops. Right, right, exactly. exactly. Now, we did the fire department, fire departments in the suburbs when I was there, and we found some good scandals there. As a matter of fact, the weekend I moved into town for, to look for a house in St. Louis, that was the weekend that that series ran. So. Yeah. All right, I'm going to pick on uh, Alyssa. Go ahead. You got a question for Ellen? I do. Um, my main question, I, I have a few uh, just because it's, it is a very interesting topic, and you seem like a fun resource of information. Um, but my main question is, was there ever a story or a lead that you wanted to follow, but you just weren't able to because of money or budget restrictions um, now with the, the changing environment of, of newspapers and bringing in a mon monetary source? Yeah, um, there there were that uh, even at the Chicago Tribune, which was uh, had tons of money, um, that was sometimes an issue. Um, but at, I'd say at that time, sometimes it was more like just fear of going at people. You know, sometimes didn't want it, the bosses who they want you going after and who not. Um, but money would money would be more of an issue maybe if it involved a lot of travel and stuff like that because that can get very expensive. So if it was a, a story that it required you to go all over the country and getting records from around the country, and it was going to take two years to do with five reporters, and maybe you couldn't afford to put that many reporters on, you know, on special assignment for that long, um, you had to sometimes decide, okay, is that worth all my effort of taking these reporters away from something else. So it's not clear cut like, no, I didn't have the money. It's a matter of, do I spend the money on this or on this? And um, so, um, so sometimes I'd pass up on something real expensive because I had some, I could get more bang for my buck out of doing something different. Um, there, there's more actually st stuff that stops you in the legal court opinions. The biggest obstacle we had in the last 10 years or so that I was in the business with privacy laws, they don't go after you so much on libel anymore, but a lot of people will go after you under privacy uh, court rulings. And, uh, and that's very hard to win. We've gotten very good at winning libel cases. In the meantime, people started filing these violation of privacy cases. So a lot of times more the issue was um, could we do it in such a way that we wouldn't lose a, a privacy suit, you know, what I'm, you know. In other words, that we invaded somebody else's privacy to get the story, and um, or you couldn't go on private land. Like we wanted to do something involving railroad tracks, but it, you couldn't go on their property. They had gotten laws passed that it was illegal trespass to go on railroad property, um, or even to take pictures of it from the road. So it, I think we had more obstacles from dealing with the laws and legal opinions and how to figure out how to get around that successfully um, than, than money issues most of the time. As, as someone who's sort of survived uh, through the changing environment, uh, do you have any tips for how to stay valuable? Oh, well, first of all, you know, keep up, keep up like crazy on all the new media that come along, make sure you, you're really facile, I don't mean you have to do code, but that you're really facile at understanding and using the digital media we have and the new new forms as it comes along and that you're creative in ways of using those different kinds of media to tell stories even better. Uh, you know, so that it, the more familiar with you that you are with it, you'll have the better you'll be doing it having ideas for using it to as part of your storytelling. And that's where I think this stuff's great because it's opened up lots of new avenues for telling stories and you have endless amounts of space. Now, space was always an issue when you had a big investigative project and I guess that's money too because that's newsprint. Um, but um, 
so make sure you're really up to date and you're using it and then th and using it creatively because then other people even not necessarily all older people but even some younger ones who don't maybe aren't as facile with it they'll look and admire it if you can figure out ways of using this to enhance your the profits um, or ideally both <laughs> and that's what I would do and make sure I'm, I'm up to speed and I'm using it in creative ways and giving people ideas for doing that and those don't necessarily all cost, they usually cost time Kurt wouldn't you say that's the biggest issue there is that that's a real cost yep yep the, the staffs on, on aren't, aren't huge uh, okay, um, I'm going to pass it around. If you have any more questions, Alyssa, hang on to them, and we'll can, we can come back to you. Uh, Jacob, I'm going to pick on you now. Why don't you give us a brief introduction of yourself, too, since you came in a little late after we did the intros. Oh, yeah, sorry. I uh, had to download the plugin and everything. Uh, my name is Jacob. Uh, I currently, right now, uh, am in marketing and public relations for Paraquad. Uh, it's a nonprofit here in St. Louis uh, right. that works with people uh, who have disabilities. Right. Um, so I've been doing that uh, about two years. Uh, prior to that, I was uh, a producer at uh, both KSDK here in St. Louis and uh, KMOV. So my background's in TV news, um, and then I transitioned. Did you work uh, with Ava Ehrlich? What's that? I did. Yeah, Ava. Absolutely. She uh, interned, I interned talking. with her and yeah, worked my I, way up. What? I said I interned. She uh, actually uh, hired me as an intern in uh, 2004, and I, I worked my way up there. Yeah, so even I go way back. She, well, she, we do too. She and I were classmates yeah. at Northwestern. Oh, oh, wow! Yeah, yeah, yeah. She uh, she's absolutely. A survivor. She's a survivor because I know how old she is. <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly. But she always writes me on my birthday greetings. <laughs> oh, geez. Well, she and Mike Shipley both have been there for a long, long yeah. time. Well, that's saying something in the television yeah. news. Yeah, it really is. Absolutely. Uh, so that is the the long sh short of my. Uh, go ahead. I'm sorry, Kurt. Were you were gonna say I was something? just saying. What's, go ahead. What's your question? Oh, my question. Uh, it's actually uh, two parts. One, uh, do you think uh, consumers know or care anymore about what properly vetted information is? And I say that. Uh, I'll use the Ferguson stuff uh, as a prime example. There was so much uh, misinformation out there. Uh, you know, there's I know there's a picture of the the cop who was involved uh, that's going around right now, uh, purported to be him in the hospital with a, a beaten face. Uh, obviously, looks nothing like him. Uh, of course, that's getting passed around. Um, yeah. Do you do you think people, uh, you know, whether majority or minority of people, care about still care about credible, good journalism, or do you think they're just interested in finding something that fits their worldview, no matter uh, where it comes from or what the facts may be? Well, I don't think you can generalize to such a point that it's everybody one or everybody the other. Right. There's no question that there are a lot of folks who want to find, just to find information that fits their worldview. And of course, in St. Louis area, um, a lot of people are into the facts point of view. It's a very racist town. Um, and um, so there's a lot of people looking for that. So none of, none of the crap that's come out uh, that's trying to um, uh, bring down the, the man who was killed and his friends and family. Um, you know, I, I shoplifted a book once. You know, no teenager should be executed for shoplifting, for, for being a, a stupid punk at 18. Uh, I mean, you know, we might have to go to a lockup or juvie. And that's, you know, that's appropriate, and you shouldn't go. But you know, so that doesn't surprise me. But I don't think you can generalize and say everybody wants this, everybody wants that. I think there are just as many people who really want to, are looking for better information, looking for what they truly see as impartial information, and they have trouble getting it. They're not getting as much from their newspapers. Um, they know that what they're getting. On, t on TV is not doing a good job of it. PBS, um, some I, NPR radio can do a lot of stuff. People, you know, you have a lot of people are really looking for it, and they, but it's hard, harder and harder to find. It's interesting that there's a very high correlation between the percentage of people who read newspapers and the percentage of people who vote regularly, and both have dropped in 
kind of similar proportions over the past few decades. And I don't know if there's a cause and effect of one to the other. It's probably just that the same external factors that are causing one are also causing the other. And so the people who aren't voting either have given up on getting good information and getting good government, or they're, they don't care anymore. They don't see it as affecting their lives. That's a big part of it. If they don't think it affects their lives or that they, or that they can't do anything about it, they're not going to bother. So there, there are both of those attitudes out there. It's not, uh, it's not that everybody is one and everybody is the other. And we're not serving those people very well in the news media now with just, you know, headlines and quick hits and Twitter posts from the people following the, the pals around the country as opposed to doing in-depth profiles on them. Um, so, I, you know, there's, there's a big, there's a lot of both. That, uh, that sort of leads me. Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry, Kurt. Well, I, I'll tell you what, Jacob. If you don't oh, mind, yeah. a little, a little sound, um, time check here. We've oh, got yeah. about oh, no. two more minutes, so let me okay. try to get a couple more questions in from your okay, classroom, sure. and then we'll cycle back. You know, if you've got any follow-up, you can always um, email me, too, after this is over. I'll give you my email when we're through. Oh, that's great. Thanks. So, Jillian, you're up. It would help if I unmuted myself. Um, I have a couple questions too. Mine are kind of easier, I think. I I read the Post Dispatch online, and sometimes I'll read through the comments, and you see people that clearly just don't have anything better to do, and they'll just kind of rip on the publisher or the editor for spelling mistakes and stuff. Oh, yeah. I miss those letters so much. <laughs> I used to respond to them. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I was curious, do you ever get offended by those, or is it just you kind of let it go, you don't get bothered by it? Well, I was very familiar already with a lot of the attitudes, negative attitudes that people bought to the Post, you know, because, you know, St. Louis has a, a sizable elite, but it's, but it's not a majority. It's a fairly small percentage, and most of the rest, they always thought, and even though I was a kid, I grew up with getting the Post-Dispatch as well as the East St. Louis paper, which there was one then. Um, people like my dad, all that, they always viewed it as, you know, it was the rich man's newspaper, and, you know, they felt it was owned by a rich man, and, you know, and that it was written for the rich men, and, and uh, very elitist, and, you know, and, and the third Mr. Pulitzer, who was a big art collector, a very good art collector. I mean, his art collection is much of which still hangs in their homes, and I've been fortunate to see some of it there too. Um, he was definitely an, a, an elitist, uh, and that, and Mrs. Pulitzer definitely is. She doesn't like having a sports section in the newspaper, for example. <laughs> she doesn't think we need one. <laughs> and. Um, so that was their image, and one of the things I worked very hard on when I was there was to try, I did lots and lots of going out to community things and meeting with people and talking with people, and um, everywhere I went, I had some family, cousins or aunts and uncles or somebody that lived in that area, and I would, you know, emphasize all my local ties and, and, uh, and that sort of thing to try to debunk the image. And, you know, over time it helped some, but it never was going to completely erase that image of the, the rich, elite, Eastern-style Pulitzers uh, owning the paper. Now, of course, in the young days of the post patch, you know, it was much more rough and tumble under the first two Joseph Pulitzers. But um, So it just had that image, and it was very hard to get over it. So the fact that I um, knew it was there, I uh, knew it had existed for, for decades, made it somewhat easier for me to deal with. I certainly wasn't surprised. If people had a legitimate beef, I would look into it. Um, we, we corrected every error, which they had not, they had not been doing. And um, so we took a complaints, the legitimate complaints very seriously. And I didn't, I, those didn't bother me because I thought it was good that people were, were keeping us on our toes. Yeah, when they don't care enough to, to call you names and criticize, then then you need to be worried. Yeah, I mean, there's there, there, you know, they had valid criticism. I took this very seriously. 
Okay, uh, we'll move on and we'll, we'll circle back, but let's go ahead and let Vanessa have a question in here. Hello. Hi. So my question, um, at University College at WashU, uh, a few of the majors, like the marketing major and the PR major, they fall under the umbrella of communications and journalism. And so I'm assuming that somewhere on our diplomas, it'll actually say communications and journalism. So I was just wondering, um, from your perspective nowadays, is it a good bet to get a degree in journalism? I kind of jumped from the journalism track to marketing, partly because I really was afraid of getting out of school and being unemployed. I would think it probably still is a good one, because always there have been a lot of people who had journalism majors who didn't go into journalism. So that's that's not a new phenomenon. I mean, that. Um, Medill, a lot of them, it was all, we also had a combined, um, we had a PR program, they still do, they call it advanced marketing now at uh, the journalism school there. So a lot of people were going into PR. I, taught, I, I was a guest professor at Arizona State a few years ago and five of my students out of this one class of 44 were going to become wedding planners <laughs> with a journalism degree. <laughs> I thought that was kind of funny. Um, and it's a great pre-law major, so several of my classmates were pre-law because they could learn to write and do research and stuff. So the fact that um, it's not going to, no, I don't know that anybody's going to find it, uh, particularly if it says communications and journalism, um, that you're going into something else. I, that's, I mean, not, not with anybody who, who's familiar with journalism schools anyway, because that's always been the case. Now, yeah. have, I don't know, uh, Kurt, you've interviewed people more often than I do. Does, does having a journalism degree, does it have, is it a big plus, a big minus, or not much difference to you when you're hiring? Oh, I think it's, a, it's still a big plus. I mean, I, I think we have to separate the idea of journalism from the idea of newspapers. Newspapers yeah. are struggling. Newspapers are having a terrible time. I would not have said this 20 years ago, but I believe it now. Newspapers will go away. Um, however, that's not journalism, and journalism is still being done. And and you know, Buzzfeed and Mashable and Politico and you know numerous other sites, Vox um, sites and uh, Fan Sided and many many other sites are popping up there where journalism is being done. And that's only the sort of quote um, Big J type journalism that you might um, uh, think about. Um, if you go to increasingly now, um, uh, companies that have major brands are hiring people with journalism backgrounds to produce content for them. And it's not just sales content either. It's not just the kind of content that says, go buy my macaroni and cheese. Um, you know, if you go to the Red Bull website, you're going to find serious journalism about, um, music and extreme sports and by the way Red Bull also produces an energy drink so you know I I think the nature of journalism is changing but the need for journalists is is not going away in my opinion so let me uh, I know Jacob I cut you off you had another question you wanted to ask Uh, I did. Uh, partially it was uh, the question about, I, well, I guess I can, it's a larger question, what do you think about uh, the comment section on news websites? Uh, I, I know a lot of uh, places it was sort of a free-for-all uh, and then they went to using Facebook as sort of your sign-in for it. Um, I still don't think that, uh, you know, weeds out the, the uh, comments that may be considered um, inciting or, uh, you know, inflammatory, whatever the case may be. So what is, what is your opinion on uh, the public comment section on websites? The only comment sections I read are the ones on Legacy.com. Do you know what that is? Yeah, the obituary <laughs> site. What? The obituary site, right? Yeah, so yeah. Are, and I, that, that's because they're always nice about that. Yeah, they're also moderated. Yeah, I know, yeah. But well, they have to be careful with that. And um, and when I'm buying uh, clothes online, I'll read the comments site to get because to get information. I, as far as all the blogs and stuff, I, I was looking last night where my husband and I are in the business of buying a new um, 
um, we're getting a new bed and mattress. And and even like there was a a mattress site that devolved into some blog over stupid things. I mean, I was like, come on, let's get back to whether this mattress is comfortable or not. Well, that's the thing. I mean, it, me personally, and I'm uh, I'm 31, so I still sort of fall into the the I think the target audience of, of people who are very uh, uh, involved in Facebook and things of that sort. I've never felt the need to publicly comment on a news story of any sort. So I just I don't know, and I'd like to know sort of what the mindset of somebody of the mindset is of somebody who says, okay, I've read this, I agree or disagree with it. Now I'm going to spew whatever whatever I'm going to spew, whether it's positive or negative. More so negative than positive. It's usually extremists on one side or the other, or it's extremists from the two sides, you know, blowing smoke at each other. Yeah. Yeah. And I don't just don't find it a valuable use of my time most of the time, do you? I don't, no. I, uh, I'd always feel dirty after I read them, too. So I try <laughs> to uh, I try to avoid uh, reading them as much as I can. But once in a while, the, my curiosity gets the better of me, and I... But in St. Louis, that's the thing, too, you know, especially if it's a story, and this is horrible, but you were saying, I mean, St. Louis still has a race problem, and I think anybody who denies that is sort of living in a, a dream world, but, you know, if it's a story involving, you know, especially someone who's black, uh, who's accused of a crime, you automatically know that 99% of these are going to be stories that are, or comments that are uh, discriminatory and just very low class and, and, and hateful in a lot of respects. So it's, you know, it's, it, again, it just, I don't think it adds anything to a story. Like, I read the story to get information out of it, and I don't care what, you know, Joe Blow and, uh, you know. I, think I might uh, look at the first few just to see if it's going to be something interesting. Oh, absolutely. And you can tell right away if it's going to devolve, if, you know, like, say if it's a book site, you know, something like that where you have some hope of some intellectual right. response. right. Well, and it's the same. It's the same too with TV, especially. You know, the the big thing now is taking uh, viewer comments from Facebook and Twitter and wasting two or three minutes reading them. I, I don't care, and I don't honestly don't think the majority of viewers at home care either. But you know, consultants have come in and told them that uh, they need to do this and this and that, and that's why it happens. But I just I don't think they add anything to to the story. But well, anyway. it's a shame too. Some uh, former classmates of mine at East St. Louis High School started one for our class. And, you know, a lot of us hadn't seen each other in years. So it was kind of fun for a while. And one guy liked to go shoot. He had a lot of pictures of Oldie St. Louis and Kerr and East St. Louis. And he would show them around. And then and we had both black and white on the site, which is unusual because right. the alumni of East St. Louis still tend to have separate reunions and that kind of thing, which pisses me off. But so quickly it evolved in some white, some of the white racist members of our class, of which there were more than needed, um, took over the site. And then eventually the, the guy who found it, he just shut it down. It mm -hmm. got so, it got so, so here's the thing, the people were just getting together, hey, I haven't seen you in 20 years, you know, blah, 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 blah. And, you know, and it was kind of fun for a while. Right. And then once these racists took over, and, you know, and I never responded to any of that because it just, then they start into you. So it, it, it can defeat some things that are, should be nice. Uh, okay, I'm going to just uh, jump in real quick here. We've got about eight more minutes. Uh, I'm going to chime in with a question from one of our classmates who was not able to be on the, on the call here. Uh, Madeline Yoakum had several questions. Uh, the one I'm going to ask, though, is do you think people should have to pay for news? Goodness gracious, what a concept. They pay when they bought their newspapers. Yes, they should. I mean, you don't ask your doctor, should I pay, do I have to pay my doctor? Why do I have to pay my dentist? Why do I have to pay for milk? You know, why do I have to pay to go to a movie? Um, excuse me, you know, I can't afford to work for free. I'm a kid from East St. Louis, and I need to make a salary out of this. So and who's, who's going to do information if they can't make at least a living out of it? None of us go, went into this to get rich, but you, you know, we do expect to be able to, you know, have a, have our, a home and feed our children and drive a, you know, a, a decent car. Well, let me let me ask you this: What do you think um, general interest newspaper or, or news organizations are producing that you would pay for? Um, well, I would pay for the New well, I am paying for the New York Times. I have a print subscription, which is very expensive, and that gives me access to their their site. So I guess I am paying for it there. 
but would you what what would you pay for what is the Sun Sentinel producing in Fort Lauderdale that you'd pay for? Well, they're not really uh, in they're not really a newspaper anymore. <laughs> And and uh, well, I'm, what I'm driving at is there's so much in a, a conventional. Hello. Newspaper. Hello. Hello. Uh oh. Hello. Now I think we're trying to get him. It might be okay now. Oh, I was I was saying there's so much of what's in local and regional newspapers that's sort of a commodity that I don't know what they're producing that I would. That I would pay for, it. like the Post Dispatch has a premium service now. I'm not sure what's there that I'm I, that's compelling me to pay for it to get for extra. You know what I'm saying? For sports or something else? Well, they have it, it, there is sports content and other um, uh, sections that they there are some pieces of their content that they put behind a paywall. Yeah. And other stuff. That they But I'm not. I'm not sure they've convinced me that what they put behind the paywall is worth it. I guess that's what I'm getting. Yeah. Uh, well, you know, there, but there, you might be paying for that information from another site. I mean, um, I would pay for Cardinals content, and I do. I get it free from the mm -hmm. post, but I pay MLB.com so that I can listen to the games on my phone. Got it. So okay. if the post offered uh, offered me what MLB.com did, I would buy it from them instead of Major League Baseball, but they don't. I think Alyssa had some other questions too. Um, was I correct? You want to chime in with something else? I think I actually had my questions answered earlier and by this whole conversation, uh, but I appreciate it. It's been very interesting. I'm curious if your class members pay for content, for journalism. All right, let's put it to them. You're up, Alyssa. Uh, I pay for the Wall Street Journal, um, but that's all I'd pay for. I think that's uh -oh. all I need. I, I think we lost Ellen, and let's hang on here for just a second and see if she can jump back in. Of course she would fall out three minutes before we're uh, done. <laughs> <laughs> Your questions have been real good. I appreciate you all chiming in here. And I think we are getting her back. Well, while we're while we're waiting for her to come back in, we can go ahead and just get the answer on 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 here. Go ahead, Jacob. Uh, I do. Uh, I still get uh, print subscriptions to the Post and the New York Times uh, Monday through Sunday, uh, so seven days a week. Um, and actually, uh, if anybody's interested in subscribing to the New York Times, it is expensive, but they have an educational rate that's an absolute steal. I get it for, uh, I want to say, 31 or $32 a month uh, for seven days a week, which is dirt cheap. Um, you have to have an EDU email address, but uh, I, I get those two newspapers. Um, you know, I of course I'm on Twitter, and I, you know I get a lot of breaking news through Twitter. But of course, obviously, it's not a lot of in-depth uh, stuff. But it'll give me the headlines of of what's going on. Um, but I still like a paper, you know. And uh, my worry is that uh, newspapers may be their own worst uh, enemy or their own worst competitor in terms of a lot of the content was given away for free, and now it's sort of raining back in what's out there, and you know. How do you do that digitally? I'm speaking of um, because everything that's in the post uh, is available digitally, um, and of course you said you could pay for the premium content, which I I think it comes with my subscription, but I've never um, used it. Uh, so. Okay. Uh, how about you, Jillian? Um, I hope this doesn't change my grade, but I go <laughs> I go out of my way to not have to pay for them. Um, so like I'll be reading the Post-Dispatch and there may be a story, as I said earlier, I love the crime section. And there may be a story in there and it says that in order to read it you have to pay for it. And it'll give you a glimpse very quickly and then it'll just kind of prompt you to have to 
subscribe to the newspaper. And so I've gotten into the habit of screen doing a screenshot before that comes up so that I don't have to pay for it. Um, <laughs> and it works, but I feel and kind of guilty. You find it more about that story on another site. So oh, I'm sure I could, but I, I think I kind of see it as a game now to see if I can get the screenshot in before it pops up and makes me pay. If yeah. you hit escape really quickly too, that works. <laughs> before the before the uh, you know the script to block it. If you if you hit escape really quickly, like right when the content pops up. So I'm not the only one then. But I pay for it. So but it, <laughs> I get what you're saying. It's frustrating because you've it's been free for so long, you know. Yeah. Well, and the other thing that I would just throw in here is even if you buy the the, the St. Louis Post Dispatch. What you're paying is a is a tiny nominal amount of money. It's, it 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 doesn't begin to cover the cost of producing the newspaper and covering the news operation. So you know when you could buy a newspaper for fifty cents or twenty five cents or a dime years ago, you, it was it was a nominal expense. It was the advertising that was subsidizing the cost of the news gathering and news production operation. So. And that's a little bit about what's behind my my question, and you know why I'm sort of pushing back on Ellen a little bit because I feel like we what we what we have gotten used to paying for news in the past has been so nominal that it it it's it nev we've never really paid for journalism. You know, we've paid a tiny little bit of, to get a newspaper, but for journalism, I'm not sure. Anyway. Are you are you able to hear us, Ellen? Because I see you're there, but I don't see your picture. Okay, well, we'll move along. I'm going to let uh, Vanessa chime in here with her answer, and then I think we're going to wrap it up because we're already past 5 or five o'clock. Um, as for my news consumption, I pretty much fall to how a lot of people are nowadays. I just kind of peruse the internet. I have a very short attention span. If you don't catch my attention, I will pretty much move on right away. Um, I usually use like the Yahoo little images, like really, really fast. I'm in and out. I don't sit still very long. So yeah, for me, it just doesn't like, it doesn't make sense for me to pay for news right now. However, I understand, um, I mean, especially as an artist, so you said nothing's for free, so people are always like, well, I don't want to pay for ballet tickets. Well, I'm like, well, I need to make a living too. So I'd almost rather just like donate money at this point because it's a cause I believe in. I believe in journalism, but I personally don't pay for news right now. Got it. Okay. All right. Well, um, I don't think we're going to get uh, Ellen back at this point. And um, what I will do is pass along my thanks to her offline, and I assume... Uh, you all have gotten uh, a, a good deal of information out of this, um, so uh, I'll share your thanks with her as well. Um, uh, I do want to thank you all for coming and for your good questions and for the good questions that got submitted in advance. So with that, I will adjourn this session, and thank you all very much. I'll see you on uh, online. Thanks. Thank you. All right. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye.